All of you, if you have a cell phone, so please put on silent or turn it off during this period of time. Thank you very much. Aloha and good evening. Welcome to the Poe Chamber of Commerce Mayor's Debate. Our sponsors for this evening's event are Family and Friends of Agriculture, All Rigor at Kiahuna, HLTA Poe Chapter, Pack Build, Poe Board of Realtors, Hong Radio, Poe Filipino Chamber of Commerce, KKCR, Poe Community Radio, YWCA of Kauai, Hoike Community Television. We are being broadcast live. I beg your pardon. Can you hear me now? Okay. We are being broadcast live tonight by KKCR, Hawaii Community Radio and will be rebroadcast on Kong Radio and Hoike Community Television. We are streaming live via the Chamber's face page, Facebook page. First, a word about tonight's format. Each candidate selected a number to determine the order in which they will make opening and closing statements and answer questions. Each candidate will have two minutes for introductions or opening statements and two minutes for closing remarks. We have a lot to cover this evening, so without further ado, please welcome the candidates for the mayor, Mr. Derek Kawakami and Mr. Mel Raposo. <laughs> According to the United States Census Bureau, just over 72,000 people call Hawaii County their home. Just over 43,000 residents are registered to vote. The median household income on Kauai is $68,224. The median home value in Kauai County is $535,600. Kauai County home values have gone up 4.9% over the past year. The median price of, of homes currently listed in Kauai County is $788,500. 8.1% of the residents live below the federal definition of poverty. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate stood at 2.3% in July on the island. Candidates, now have two minutes for opening remarks. Going first tonight is Mr. Derek Kawakami. Sir, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Derek Kawakami and I want to first and foremost thank the Chamber of Commerce and all of the sponsors, all of the volunteers. I know how much tremendous work that you've put into this event to bring our voice to the people. So first and foremost, mahalo nui loa. Thank you to my wife, my daughter Haley, my son Christopher for being very supportive. And last but not least, thank you to everyone here who took the time to hear us tonight. And for everybody listening on the radio, I hope that we can entertain you tonight. I'm surely going to be um, eager to, to hear the responses from Mel. We served together on the county council and I tell you it's been some pretty exciting times so I'm very excited. So to Mel, thank you as well. You bring out the best in me. So thank you. I want to say that um, many of you folks know that I'm on the county council. I've had a great tremendous opportunity to serve on a various um, types of level. Uh, KIEC board of directors, I was appointed to the State House of Representatives, and I'm back here on the County Council. This is a chamber event, and I have to tell you that, you know, I got my start in the private sector. Our family was blessed to have been able to grow a business that has served many of you throughout the community. I look forward to answering the questions, and I really look forward to bringing that diverse experience to the Mayor's office. So thank you so much, and God bless. Up next, Mr. Mel Workoso. Mel, you have two minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Chamber, for uh, being here. And let me apologize up front. I'm, I have this cold and I have a cough, so I'm going to try and hold it in as much as I can. But thank you to the Chamber for putting this on, to the public for being here, um, as well as my wife, Patsy, who's here. We celebrated our 29th anniversary two days ago. This is her anniversary present, being here at the Chamber Forum <laughs> for debate. And of course, Derek, um, as he stated, we, we've, been, we've been friends longer than we've been colleagues. And uh, I made a fatal mistake many years ago 
um, in my office at the council. He wasn't even on a council. And I told him, you know, Derek, you should run for council. <laughs> Mistake. But anyway, um, Derek and I work really well together. And, and I'm looking forward to for an excellent uh, two months left on this campaign. Uh, as far as myself, I've served 14 years on the county council, the last four as the chair. Uh, started off my career at Kauai Police Department. I was 19 years old, served 12 years there, as well as uh, the Hawaii National Guard, retired with uh, 21 years of service. Uh, I have two children who I would love to have had here tonight to watch this, and I'm hoping that they're listening on KKCR. But um, because of the conditions here and housing issues, uh, they simply cannot live here. And, and that, that frustrates me, and it's kind of what's driving me to really um, uh, make a difference here on Kauai as your next mayor. We've got a lot of issues. Uh, I don't think the issues differ between Derek and myself. It's, it's what you're all going to have to decide tonight and, and for the remainder of the, the, the two months is, you know, uh, you've got you to select the next mayor. And I'm asking your support. I'm, uh, I'm going to hopefully tonight we'll get through uh, the questions that will uh, show the difference between the two of us, which I don't think there's much. But at the end of the day, um, I'm here to keep Kauai moving, to make a difference, and uh, to keep Kauai Kauai. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer portion of the debate. As a reminder, candidates have two minutes to answer each question, which is followed by 30 and 15 seconds for rebuttals. Question number one, we'll start off with Mr. Carl Kami. What incentives can the county put in place to increase agricultural income and opportunities throughout Hawaii? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. And I'm very optimistic about the future of uh, agriculture. You know, my family has roots deeply ingrained in agriculture. My grandfather, H.S., came from Japan to work the sugar plantations. My mother, Arlene, grew up in Julio Valley. Her mom and dad and her family have farmed in Julio Valley, and I continue to have family members that farm down in Julio Valley. You know, some of the incentives that we can give agriculture, we've been able to give before. You know, I've been blessed to have been able to serve in the Hawaii State House of Representatives, and every single year, our Koi delegation made appropriations for good ag projects. Whether it was supporting the East Kauai Water Users Cooperative, or appropriating over $3 million for our farmers in Moloa'a, or even giving a grant and aid to the Kilauea Ag Park and Waipa for their Hali Imu and their commercial kitchen. That's the type of incentives that farmers need. You know, on the county council when I first ran and got elected, one of the first things that I did was to allow value-added products in our sunshine markets. And that comes from my grocery background. You know, I lived and breathed in a grocery store. I know exactly how much food we import and it's not acceptable. We need to support our ag industry. We need to support farmers. Currently, we just passed a bill that Councilmember Kanashiro and myself introduced to even expand the sunshine markets by allowing ranch products, beef, poultry, eggs, in-season whole caught fish. You know, these are the type of incentives that we can support farmers and increase their profitability. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Koso, you have 30 seconds to respond. Thank you. Not so much a rebuttal, but really more uh, uh, a compliment, really, to Mr. Kaukami and Kanashiro. The last bill which <clears throat> we just passed, <clears throat> which would allow the value added, would allow fish and, and uh, meats and, and, and sheep and all that, I think is going to do great things. But I think we have a great model out in Kilauea with the Ag Park that took over 20 years to get together, uh, put together and get it going. Uh, Mayor Cavallo has really done a great job with stewardship agreements where we connect and partner with nonprofits around the island. Uh, for various cultural activities, and I think we need to continue that stewardship agreements with agricultural activities. Thank you. Thank you. Is it coming? Come you have 15 seconds? Yeah. Sure. I'd just like to add, too, that the best way that we can support farmers is to ensure that they have water. You know, no, no water, no farmers, no food. And it's a controversial topic, but we need to ensure that our farmers can receive the water that they so much need. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Raposo, you will be going first. How would you improve our county parks to keep our county beaches clean and safe? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you very much. That's a tough question um, that, that comes up a lot. You know, I, I believe our park system, we have many, many parks on this island, some passive, some active, and, and what it really boils down to is, is resources and making sure that we do assessments in our parks to determine which parks uh, have the most use, and then we, we have that inventory 
uh, it's just a matter of accountability with our with our parks department, uh, holding people accountable to to these different parks. Uh, and I have a very simple solution, which I had raised with the with the mayor and the current mayor years ago, which was at every park, like they do on every military aircraft, they put the name of the chief mechanic and the pilot. My suggestion to the mayor was it wouldn't cost the county a penny. At every park, you put the names of the employees that maintain that park. It gives them a sense of ownership, it restores the pride, and it, it also will ensure that the, the public will know who to contact in the event uh, there are some problems with that park. At the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we, we need to find a uh, director of parks that is uh, uh, qualified and, 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 and will be held accountable to make sure that these parks are being taken care of. We have had a rash of complaints regarding the restroom facilities, and yes, a lot of it is due to vandalism from the public, and we, we do a better, we've got to do a better job with the, uh, the security and our, and our police making checks. But we've got to restore pride back in our workforce. Uh, that's number one. And, and once we can do that and, and empower them with the ability to, to take care of our parks, uh, I think we all will see a, va a very, very uh, huge improvement in the parks that we have on Kauai. And we need to keep those parks clean, not just for the, the visitors, but for our residents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carl Comey, you have 30 seconds to respond. Thank you. You know, there's so many community organizations that have reached out that want to enter into this public-private partnership. So many organizations have reached out to say, hey, we have a crew of people who are always at the park. Let us participate. I think, you know, getting that community involvement, getting them to take that ownership, it instills pride and you're less likely to have vandalism. You know, we had a pilot project at Menihuni Food Mart where we let the kids come out and maintain that area. And you know what? It's been proven to work. We need to partner up with the community. We can do this all together. Hello. Mr. Report, you have 15 seconds. Thank you. And you know, we, we do have, we've tried that for many years. We've had, we've had Adopt the Parks. It's simply not working. And, and in some cases, they do. Uh, at the end of the day, it's still the responsibility and the obligation of the, of the county, the Parks Department, to ensure our parks are clean and safe. Thank you. Thank you. The third question will be, Mr. Carl coming on first. In March of 2017, it was reported that there are 1,600 cesspools and 120 ejection wells in the Hoipu area. The report indicated that some of these are overflowing and polluting Waikomo Street, and similar situations exist throughout Kauai County. What will you do as mayor to address the problem identified, including advocating for state and federal resources and help improve the water quality in our streams, Mr. Carl Tommy Tunes. Thank you. You know, I'm a surfer. I'm a lifelong ocean lover. That ocean is my playground. If anybody's gonna protect that ocean, it's gonna be the people that cherish it. I can tell you cesspools and injection wells and to some sort of cases, even septic systems are no longer appropriate. They used to work, they no longer work. They pollute our waters, waterways, our oceans. And you know, in cases of Maui, it's even uh, entering into their drinking water. I think what needs to happen is the county of Kauai needs to invest in infrastructure improvements, and that means wastewater. And where we can't get wastewater and sewer, we need to find ways where we can convert these cesspools over into individual wastewater treatments. And the way to do it, because financing is so challenging in areas, is there's a model where a homeowner can amortize the cost of those improvements over the course of time. If they can't qualify a loan, it's called on-bill financing. They can actually, through either property tax assessments or even on their water bill, amortize the cost of that septic system conversion over the course of 30 years. And it's been done in other municipalities. I think that's the way that we can get conversions over. On some of these other areas where there's TBRs and people can't afford, when they sell that property, they need to be mandated to convert those over. I really feel strongly about that. If they can afford to pay for it, they should be. We had incentives out there on the North Shore. These people that could afford to do it didn't take those incentives. I really believe it's a matter of time where it's going to be mandated by the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. You know, not much to reply. This will be a boring debate because they agree on more than we disagree. 
But the, the reality is we have to stop the cesspools, injection wells. We need to get this island in, into a, an island-wide sewer system. You know, we're working on an infrastructure plan right now. I think Derek talked about some creative financing opportunities as well as grant funding opportunities from the federal government. But at the end of the day, this island has to get away from cesspools and injection wells, and we need to get the wastewater systems and make it available to everyone. And I support as well the mandatory requirement or the requirement for these homeowners to, to uh, convert. As, as soon as they can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. No. Thank you very much. Question number four. Sir Pozo, you go first. Do you think Kauai has a carrying capacity of how many visitors we can reasonably accommodate on any given day? If yes, how would you better manage our capacity? You have two minutes, sir. You, you know, that's a tough question because how do you determine the capacity uh, scientifically or with data? I can tell you that in my personal experience, and I think every one of you in this room would agree that we have reached that capacity uh, a while ago, that in fact we have more visitors than we can accommodate and handle right now. And I'm not talking about hotel rooms and TVRs and bed and breakfasts and Airbnbs. I'm talking about our infrastructure. Based on infrastructure that we have today, we cannot handle more uh, tourists coming to this island every single day. I, I get frustrated when I, we watch the news and we watch the press releases from the visitors bureaus and they do a great job. They do a very good job uh, selling Hawaii. But the problem is that these uh, airlines are getting more routes to Kauai and every time one new airline get, gets a new route to Kauai, that's another 70,000 people that will be here in the year. That's 70 more thousand people that's going to be using our parks and our roads and our restrooms. Uh, and, and we have no say. And I think this county and the mayor needs to set the example and lead the charge by holding up our hands and saying, State, you need to stop. And before you create more routes to Kauai, you need to give our people an opportunity to, to have some input. Our parks are overwhelmed. Our roads are overwhelmed. And, and if you, as we do, we stand on a side of the road and wave uh, as we campaigning, I got to believe every one out of every two cars is a rental car. And we cannot handle any more. And I, you know, again, for the visitors bureaus, the tourism authority, they're doing a great job. But I think we have become a victim of our own success. And at, at, we're at the point we got to say, "Whoa, time out. Let us regroup. Let us reset." Thank you. Mr. You know, I wholeheartedly support our visitor industry, but I can tell you, when one in eight homes on Koi is a vacation rental, we have an issue. And part of that overcapacity is that vacation rental market, the illegal vacation rental market. You know, recently I proposed a tax increase on vacation rentals to bring it to the same level as hotel and resort. I believe that there are hotel and resort operations. They should pay their fair share into our infrastructure. And you know what? Our administration will go after these illegal vacation rentals and to amortize them out of our inventory. Thank you. Thank you. I agree, and <clears throat> I think it's no secret that I've been a very aggressive advocate for the prosecution of these illegal vacation rentals for as long as I've been on this council, and that will continue with a special unit in planning that will go out, and that's all they will do is enforce and prosecute these illegal vacation rentals. Thank you. Question number five, Mr. Paul Kami, this will be for you. The threat of hurricanes, tsunamis, flooding, and man-made disasters are real here in Hawaii. What steps would you take as mayor to ensure our county is more disaster ready? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you for the question. You know, it's no secret that we're dealing with climate change. The frequency and strength of these hurricanes have been growing, and it's something that we need to be prepared for our folks. We live on an island, and our resilience is just of the utmost importance. You know, what I got to witness after the floods in April while I was sitting in that EOC was tremendous amounts of collaboration. And for some people, what looked like chaos, it was actually very organized. It's amazing the communication that went in on that room. We had people that were collecting data in that EOC every single day, and that night team would formulate a plan for that next day and implement that action plan. You know, moving forward, we have to drill, drill, and drill. Like any other thing, it's muscle memory and it's your ability to actually go out there and perform when you're in a time of crisis. I can tell you that our police department, our fire department, our water safety officers are out there every single day preparing for this type of disaster. Moving forward, we need to ensure our resilience. 
we need to make sure that we have a climate action plan. Recently, we had the Hawaii Community Foundation offer the county $100,000 to formulate a county climate action plan. Unfortunately, it was turned down. I do think that was a big mistake. But moving forward to address these type of storms and disasters, whether it's nature or man-made, we need to be ready, and I really have faith in our public safety that they're doing everything that they can to make sure that this public, that this island and our people are safe and ready for any disaster. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, it's, it's really the, the preparation and the training. You know, our county, we train for a lot of disasters. We train for uh, terrorist activity. We train for nuclear attack. We train for a lot of things because the federal government funds these types of trainings for our police departments and our uh, what was what was used to be known as the civil defense. Uh, we need to we need to formulate a training that is is uh, much more um, uh, frequent for the, the natural disasters because our chances of us getting a natural disaster and we've been blessed and we've been faced with all these deep miss, uh, near misses, but um, we got to practice and be ready. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like to also add that it's such an important component where all those nonprofit organizations, American Red Cross, Malama Kauai, I can't name them all, but just to see them get engaged and just get those boots on the ground, it was amazing. I think we as government can actually learn a lot from those nonprofits that have deployed. Mahalo. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Raposo, you'll be going first. The state of Hawaii has made a mandate for reaching 100% renewable energy production by the year 2015. KIUC is well on its way to meeting that goal, but has recently experienced opposition to one of its existing hydro facilities. KIUC maintains that it is important to have a diverse renewable energy portfolio. What are your thoughts on how our utility is attempting to reach the state's 100% mandate. Two minutes, sir. Thank you, and you said 2015, I believe it's 2025. Uh, well, I've just been taxed to uh, read I, I just want to make sure I understand that question because I don't want to make a fool of myself up here. Uh, Mr. <laughs> yes. 25. 25. Okay, 2025. Okay. All right, thank you very much, I think you all. You know, that, that's one of the challenges being on the county council. This goes back up many, many years. We talked about uh, energy sustainability and, and renewable energies. And if a proposal is made uh, to put up some wind farms, then the, uh, then the uh, objections because of the danger to the birds. And then if you want to do a hydro, then, then the objections. And uh, it, it's very difficult to satisfy everyone. But you know, as I have traveled across this country as a council member and been honored and, and just blessed to have served this county. Uh, many municipalities that uh, utilize hydro, and, and I gotta tell you, when we are paying 48 cents or whatever it is a kilowatt, and these guys are paying seven cents a kilowatt and because they have hydro, I support hydro. I also support the, the proper handling of our natural resources as well. And, I, and the, the regulations are in place, and I believe the community does have an input, but at the end of the day, if we wanna reach that 2025 goal, uh, there's gonna have to be some tough decisions to be made and one of them is, in fact, whether or not we, we move towards these other alternative uh, sources of energy, which in hydro is, is one. Uh, you know, because of our situation with the birds, uh, because of the Endangered Species Act, we are not able to do wind. We have sun and we have a lot of water. And I believe if we, if we responsibly use those resources, uh, we can reach that goal in 2025. And yet it's not going to make everyone happy. But you cannot have your cake and eat it too. And I believe in hydro. I think hydro is the cleanest way to produce these energies, and I will support. Thank you. Thank you. I was very blessed to have been part of that KIUC team as a chair of strategic planning during the time when we said we're going to go after this renewable energy. And you know what? People need to remember that the key is that there is no sing single silver bullet. We need to have a diversified portfolio of renewable energy. Hydro is clean. There are no dams that are being built. There are no dams that are being proposed. It's run of the river, it's renewable, it's clean, and it's dependent. I fully support KIUC's endeavor for more hydro, and I really think we're gonna achieve that 100% before that deadline. Thank you. 
And, and I think it's important to note that as the water comes down, the stream goes through the hydrant, it actually gets recycled right back up to the top. So there is really no water loss. It's a great technology that we should be using more of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kaukami, you will be going first on this question. The Me Too and Time's Up movements have elevated awareness of the staggering numbers of individuals that have experienced sexual harassment, sexual assault, and gender discrimination. Courtney County in the past has had several lawsuits regarding sexual harassment and gender discrimination resulting in taxpayer money being used for large settlements. How would you ensure all county employees are protected and safe in their jobs, sir? Thank you. You know, during my time at Big Save and many Winnie Food Mart, sexual harassment training, gender discrimination, hostile work environment, it was at the top of our list of concerns. And it all starts with having a good human resources department that gets out there every single day to train each and every one of our employees about what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior. As your mayor, I bring that experience to the table. We will not tolerate any type of discrimination. We will not tolerate any type of hostile work environment. And I can tell you, it comes down to training and holding people accountable. Oftentimes, government does not see themselves as having a vested interest in that operation. For many of you chamber members that are owners of business, you take these issues seriously to heart because every single lawsuit comes directly out of your pocket. Every single lawsuit comes directly out of all of your employees' pockets. We've seen discrimination happen time and time again. As mayor, each member of our department heads, each member of our department, all the way to the top level will be held accountable and it will not be tolerated and it all starts back at that human resource to make sure that everybody is trained appropriately and not just trained once, these type of issues require constant retraining. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Cole, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. You know, I, I bring to the mayor's office 21 years of experience uh, and training in the military. And whether you agree or disagree with the military, I gotta I, I, I let you know one thing, that wherever I went, whether it was in, in, in a base in, in, in the country or it was a, a, a peanut field in South Korea, the training throughout the military is standardized and required. That is what is lacking in this county. We leave trainings up to different departments. We need standardized training. I agree with Derek that zero tolerance is the only way to go, but we cannot assume that the employee is trained unless we uh, hold the departments accountable and we provide the training. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And furthermore, we're going to partner up with these wonderful organizations like the YWCA, the ACLU that have expertise in these type of issues. And we're going to make sure that workers that are out there feel safe to come to their mayor, to come to their department heads to report any of that inappropriate behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Raposo, this next question is for you. Many chamber members report that the lack of affordable housing on Kauai is negatively impacting their ability to recruit workers. New recruits are turning down jobs because they can't find a reasonably priced home or rental. Also, the high cost of land acquisition and infrastructure improvements deter many developers as they are forced to pay these costs. Building requirements, which increase costs, are also obstacles for developers. How can the county address the housing crisis, especially for land acquisition and infrastructure improvements? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. You know, with the large landowners here on Kauai, A&B and Grove Farm, Dan Robinson, uh, they, they hold the majority of the land here. The county, we, we do not. We don't have land. And, and obviously, without land, it's very difficult to put out these affordable housing projects. Um, working with these developers uh, or landowners, uh, I do not have a problem offering uh, incentives for future developments in the way of density credits to secure some of the lands that we have now. The only way we're going to reach the goals that we need to reach with affordable housing is to work with our nonprofit organizations that can put up these homes at a much lower cost than the county can. Uh, and, 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 but any of these projects that we're going to build from the ground up is going to take some time. You know, our council, I'm very proud that our council passed an additional uh, rental unit bill that now allows homeowners to, to build an extra unit. 
we have a very ready source or, uh, revit or inventory of units right now with current homeowners that we can turn and uh, with incentives allow them to create rentals for people. We need to exercise our authority under the state law where the mayor can designate specific areas as experimental developments where they are exempt from the zoning code and permits, yet they still have to be inspected and they still have to follow the code, but they are not required to go through the long process of getting permits if we can get those homes out much quicker. The other thing we need to do, and one of the, my projects, immediate projects, would be to uh, change over our permitting process. Our, you know, you, to wait nine months for a permit or a year uh, it really prohibits our developers from, from uh, producing affordable housing here in Kauai. Uh, and then just the cost, the water meters and, and, and the septic requirements. So the county, if we want, if we're serious about it, then we are going to have to step up. And we're going to have to uh, subsidize these projects to a certain extent. Uh, but we're going to have to do it to, to produce the units. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul, come here for your second to respond. You know, I want to say I disagree <coughs> with not having land. We do have tremendous amounts of land. We're going to partner up with the state. We have some county properties currently right now that we're looking to develop. One of the, the Kauai Police Department, the old Lihui Kauai Police Department, that's a state parcel. We're going to work with them. We're going to work with developers to enter into a long-term 65-year lease agreement where the public still owns the land. We're going to take the land cost out of the equation. A developer can come and build an apartment-style rental unit. The people still own the land. We get that affordable housing rental that we so much need. That's the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a yeah, that, that's still state land. And I, I'm talking about available land that the county owns right now that we can develop. We've got five acres by the neighborhood, uh, by the stadium, and we have little pockets around the area. But when, if we want to make a dent, well, we need thousands and thousands of units. Uh, you know, eight or ten units is not going to do the trick. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carl Kami, this is your question. Many municipalities offer tax incentives and other benefits to businesses who locate in targeted areas for economic development. Would you support tax or other incentives to businesses that locate in areas we are trying to revitalize, such as Rice Street? You have two minutes. Sure thing, absolutely. And, and currently, and I can't remember the, the specific name of the program, but we do have tax incentive programs um, for businesses, actually, that are operating in, in areas of, of lower income, and, and that currently exists. Um, it, it's called, uh, I think, an economic zone. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on it. But there, there's many other ways to create incentives for businesses and to attract them to certain places. And, and one of them is happening right here on Rice Street. You know, there's, there's a big federal invest, investment going on as far as that Tiger Grant. It's going to improve the area of Rice Street. It's going to improve mobility. It's going to allow people to walk and bike easier around the area. And it's really going to slow traffic down as far as vehicular miles per hour, which needs to happen on Rice Street. People are driving way too fast in that area. It's going to improve circulation. It's going to improve infrastructure. It's going to make Rice Street a lot more appealing for businesses to come on down, open up business, open up shop, and bring some economic revenue to county government as well. You know, other things that we can look at that I was a part of is Senator Wakai and myself created an incentive program for manufacturing. We created the Manufacturers Assistance Program, and there's many companies on Kauai that have taken advantage of that program. So we can get very creative as far as how government, both county and state, can partner up to bring these type of incentives, because our local mom and pops, they're the biggest employers. That's the bread and butter. That's the heart of Main Street and, and Main Street USA. Without supporting our mom and pops, who are our biggest employer, you know, our economic recovery is, is going to be very challenging moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oposley, you have 30 seconds to respond. Thank you. Um, and the zones are called enterprise zones, and, and I think they're, they're a great thing. Uh, you know, my problem with the, the redevelopment of Rice Street and the Tiger Grant, great, great 13 million, I think we just got an additional 2 million. But it's going to take Rice Street from four lanes down to two with a, a turn lane in the middle. And, and yes, it may slow down the traffic, but I think the problem that we're going to have is not going to do anything for congestion. We, if you remember, if you've been here long enough, you know Rice Street used to be two lanes, and we had to invest a lot of money to make it four. Now we're going to go back to two. Uh, it's going to cause some problems on Rice Street. Thank you. I disagree. The people on Rice Street are not complaining about it. They're very excited anticipating it. 
You know, the traffic experts have said it's not going to be a significant decrease on the traffic flow on Rice Street. It's going to be a great project. It's going to allow for a lot of jobs. And you take a look at how many people are relying on these capital improvement projects. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Okozo, this is your question. With unemployment at near record lows, many businesses and organizations are struggling to recruit and retain qualified workers. What efforts would you take as mayor to support the development and training of Kauai workers? You have two minutes, sir. Uh, you know, I think that, that this is a multifaceted problem in Kauai, and, and I'm gonna be real right here. You know, the incentives for our uh, people on assistance right now to go to work, there is really no incentive. Uh, I have spoken to numerous people that have come to me and said, you know, for whatever, for issues, and I said, hey, you work? He goes, no, no sense, work. If I work, I lose my benefit. And, and that's sad, but that's what's happening right now. As far as training our, our workforce, I absolutely support that. And I think the county should play a role in that. I think that's part of our economic development uh, in the county. That's one of our goals that should be. You know, right now our economic development, yeah, we're out there, we have it's very minimal staff. You know, we lost our agricultural specialist. That position was removed by the administration. And yet we have to look at agriculture as one of our, besides tourism, is one of our industries that we, we can re, uh, re, rejuvenate. And we gotta get people trained. We got fabulous programs at Wyoming High School that I, I watch these kids learn. Kauai Community College to the UH system. We need to step up our game and, and find the land and, and, and with the state and their agricultural development corporation, a lot of land available. But we gotta get these young ones, and in some cases, some old ones, trained or cross-trained and get them into the, train, into the positions and jobs that are available. But yet we're still fighting this, this issue where the incentive to go out and find a job is not there anymore. And I'm not sure how we get around that because it's not a county issue. But as far as setting up the training programs through our economic development office, I fully support that and would encourage uh, you know, the, the council, the city council to do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Paul, finally, your response. You know, our unemployment rate is a result partially because of our lack of affordable housing. And I can tell you to characterize that that Kauai Police Department project will only bring eight units online, it, it's not truthful. We can build up to five stories in Lihui. And with the density bonus that was just passed by the council without myself, because I had to recuse, it offers even more affordability because of the density bonus that they granted. I can tell you the unemployment rate is cyclical, but it's also a symptom of the lack of affordable housing. We need to tackle housing. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I, again, I go back to the four lane to two lane, doubling the density of Rice Street. That's a formula for disaster, if you ask me, as, as it relates to congestion and, and traffic. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Paul Hummer, regarding the county budget, in your opinion, what is the county, what is the county spending too much on, not enough on? Your question. You know, the county budget is, is mostly going to be consumed with salaries, benefits, and post-employment benefits. That leaves very little at the end of the day to tackle on projects like parks and recreation, roads and repair and maintenance. I, I can tell you, budget after budget, we've heard rhetoric that we can make these big cuts. I've been on enough budgets to see that that is not as easy as it sounds. I can tell you where we need to spend more money. It's on our roads, our road conditions, our park facilities, park maintenance, maintaining what we currently have, and that's the top priority. You know, right now, the state and county and federal governments have all said, as far as roads, their top priority is taking care of repair and maintenance of current inventory. And I can tell you, in this last budget, I was able to work with Council Member Chop to infuse this county budget with $4.3 million of additional revenue that's gonna go 2.7 million dollars for affordable housing, a little less than 1 million dollars to replenish our safety net reserve that was drawn out after the floods in April. And we're gonna be able to build that comfort station at Medina Stadium for all of those soccer players and soccer moms that have complained to us about the porta potty conditions. I can tell you it's easy to say that we're gonna cut the fat, but year after year we've seen budget after budget where that has been rhetoric. I know it's what the people wanna hear, but we haven't seen it happen. In business, you can either cut expense or generate revenue, and these are the places where we're gonna focus our energy 
infrastructure, road conditions, park and park and facility maintenance as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo, for your second to respond. The problem is you cannot continue to tax the people to pay for these improvements. The, the duplication of services in our county right now is, is no joke. I have, in the last two budgets, proposed cuts of all the vacant positions that were vacant for over 500 days and could not get the support of this council to do so. We tried to make the cuts. You cannot get the councils to, to, to agree. But duplication of service, number one, I will do staffing audits, performance audits to determine exactly what is the right size for this county and make those tough decisions to, to reduce the size and expenses of this county. Thank you. And furthermore, we're going to increase our budget by 25 million additional dollars with that general excise tax surcharge. It was an unpopular thing to do, but the right thing to do is going to generate jobs. We're going to be able to alleviate traffic. We're going to be able to address potholes and our road conditions. And I can tell you, it needed to be done. It was the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo, the Office of Economic Development is an important potential driver and resource for the Kauai business community. As mayor, what priorities would you set for OED and how would you structure the office to support the needs of our business community and help grow our economy? Please be specific in terms of what sectors of our economy would be supported by and how. I think I, thank you. And I think I mentioned the first one, the, the priority in my mind right now for uh, economic development would be the agricultural sector. We had a ag specialist that uh, Mr. Bill Spitz did a great job and, and when he retired, uh, the administration decided that they would not continue that position. I think that was a huge mistake. That position needs to be uh, reinstated and, and we need to really pursue that and, and giving that, empowering that, that specialist to go out and make things happen in our agricultural sector. You know, tourism, do we need more help from the county with tourism? Absolutely not. I think we work well with our Visitors Bureau and I think we, we, we that partnership is going to remain, but at the end of the day, we, we, we don't need to help them anymore. I, I think they're doing a great job. The training that we talked about earlier, economic development needs to be involved in developing our economy. And that is where the training of our workforce, our young ones, working with the schools and the college, getting our kids involved in the training so we can get them into the workforce. That's what our economic development needs to be doing. Right now, I think the majority of our work, we're basically a clearinghouse for grants. We get grants from the Hawaii Community Foundation or from all these different agencies, federal and state and private entities. It flows through the economic development and our poor director's gotta go monitor these grants. We need that director to be taking care of developing our economy. And the two sectors, sectors I believe right now, agriculture is definitely number one, and, and as I stated earlier, the training of our young workforce to get them into, into jobs that are available for them right now. And, and that, that's, that's my plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul, tell me 30 seconds to respond. You know, I think the key thing is to partner up with our private sector partners as well. You know, the Chamber of Commerce, KDB, these are tremendous resources that I don't think that we've tapped into as much as we should. The one thing that I would like to specifically focus on as well as agriculture is STEM. Our students are going off to college and, and really investing in science, technology, engineering, and math. We need to bring some of that presence into the office of OED to make sure that we're diversifying our economy and that we have these 21st century jobs so that our kids can come back home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul, what you Yeah, I cannot uh, disagree more um, with the STEM. The problem is we've tried that, we've had STEM. You know, these companies come and they go. It's very difficult because of our business climate here to have a business. <clears throat> but the STEM uh, area is another area that we have a lot of interest, a lot of community involvement and private sector involvement that we should pursue as well. Thank you. Mr. Paul Kami, according to the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice, one out of every eight homes on Kauai is a vacation rental. This is one of many factors contributing to the lack of affordable housing across the county. How can the county promote the creation of rental and workforce housing in order to alleviate the pressure created by the rapidly increasing rents and limited inventory? You have two minutes. Thank you, this is a, a two-fold question. One, one in eight homes is a vacation rental. We need to make sure that we're getting some of these illegal vaca vacation rentals back into our local neighborhoods. A few ways that we can do this is one, 
take a look at rapidly enforcing the current law that we have on our books. You know, for the most part, the planning department has going out and enforcing, and those units that are charging $300 to $500 a night, they're, they're actually ceasing and desisting. But on these higher end vacation rentals that are operating illegally, that are charging $5,000 $5, a night, they're just, they're brushing it off, quite frankly. And this is where we need to really take a look and see if our fines need to be raised once more again. Also, when we talk about how can we do our part as county government to get more affordable housing, I'm going to say it again. One of the things that I did at the legislature is to commission money for a study to do a master plan for Mahilona Hospital and that property. And I can tell you, the relationships that I've been able to build with our state legislators, the relationships that I've been able to build with private developers to get them all to the table, that master plan, that money was also just reinstated by Rep Nakamura. They're going to be able to master plan Mahilona. If we as county government and state government can take the cost the two highest costs of construction for affordable housing. We take infrastructure costs because that's our job. Our job is infrastructure. If we take the cost of the equation of land, we can get those units to be more affordable. The thought process that we're gonna have the developer do everything and bear all the burden is the reason why we don't have affordable housing today. We do this by collaborating, we do this by partnerships, and we do this by being practical business leaders to be able to negotiate a win-win situation. If there's no great return on investment for developers, they're not going to come and build anything. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Okozi, you have 30 seconds to respond. Thank you. Two enforcement officers, $100,000 a year in salaries, $10,000 a day per violation. The fines will fund the office. We need to get rid of these illegal vacation rentals. Now, we're not going to convert those units into affordable houses. But what it's going to do is it's going to open up an inventory of homes that they will have no other choice but to, to do long-term rentals, which will, again, when you open up inventory, all the way up and down the chain, you get vacancies and you get families back in homes. So yeah, we're not gonna convert transit vacation rentals into affordable housing, but we'll increase inventory. Thank you. This is Paul Fundy, I think you're saying. I disagree. Some of these units that are being rented out on Airbnb are very modest homes, a lot of them. And Airbnb, by the way, has been designed to make it challenging for county planning enforcers to go out there and actually identify these illegal units. But I can tell you, we need to hold Airbnb and other companies accountable as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Raposo, this is your question. There is a proposed constitutional amendment that will create a surcharge on investment properties to fund public education. The proposal leaves the definition of an investment property and the surcharge amount to be determined by the state legislature. Real property taxes are county programs and the primary source of income for Hawaii counties. The proposal creates state interference with each county's real property taxes. Those taxes pay for infrastructure, maintenance, labor, and other expenses. Many home and land owners also worry that the loose interpretation of an investment property can have adverse effects and unintended consequences. If this amendment passes, do you feel that you will be hampered from raising appropriate revenues via the real property tax to cover necessary county operational expenses? You have two, two minutes, sir. Thank you. First of all, it's not a surcharge, it's a tax. You know, the real property taxes, the county is really, really only our only source of revenue. The state has already tapped, capped our transit accommodation tax revenues. They've already taken some of our TAT revenues and taken, sent it over to Oahu for the real project. Now they are using the guise of education and our kids and saying, hey, we're gonna put a surcharge, it's not a surcharge, it's a tax, on, a, on the county's real property tax system. And, and I, I, I'm not supporting it, I don't support it. And if you read the actual amendment, it is so broad, it doesn't assure anyone that the money is gonna end up in the classrooms where the money belongs. We have enough money in the Department of Education. You know, I think we're the second highest uh, paid Department of Education or the funded departments in the, in the country, and yet our school teachers are on the bottom. There is no assurance. This is, is my opinion that it's a money grab, another one, and we need to preserve our right as counties, as a mayor. I stand tall and very hard and aggressive against this because we need to, to, to maintain our ability to, to uh, use the, the, the property taxes as our main source of revenue. Now the state has crept into our territory. And again, to disguise this as a, as a surcharge, when it really is a tax on property, 
which traditionally has been the county's function. So uh, I af absolutely do not support it. This will hamper our ability in the event there is a shortfall and we need to increase property taxes. Our constituents, our taxpayers are gonna be hurt. And it's gonna be very difficult for counties across the state to increase property taxes knowing that the state already has tagged on a, um, a surcharge, or which is an additional tax, and, and again, hamper our efforts to raise or generate the necessary revenue to cover operational expenses for our counties. So definitely do not support this. Thank you. Mr. Paul Comey, you have three seconds to respond, sir. Thank you. I'm, I'm married to a school teacher. I was raised by a school teacher. My mother in law is a school teacher. Auntie Marianne, right there, is a school teacher. We love our school teachers, we love our students, but this is not the right way to fund schools. I can tell you, it jeopardizes county, our county government, and it's so ambiguous and vague that the unintended consequences could really actually raise the rent for some of the rental units that some of these teachers are living in. It's undetailed, it's undefined. We love our teachers, but it's not the right thing to do. Thank you. Mr. Paul, you have 15 seconds to respond. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Paul Kami, this is for you. Traffic congestion is one of the biggest challenges facing our island's future. No one travels to paradise in order to sit in traffic and commute times for local residents are growing longer and longer. Rush hour traffic is extending to longer periods of the day. Building more roads is one possible solution and increasing convenient and affordable public transportation options is another. How do we make public transportation more convenient so that more people will utilize it, which will reduce the number of cars on our roadways? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. you know, public transportation is, is actually undergoing an efficiency study as we speak. And some of the cost savings that they're gonna find within those efficiencies will bring more operational hours into the weekend and nighttime. So that's gonna add some convenience. You know, our roads are chronically congested with traffic. You know, we all know this, we have work commuting, we have school commuting, and we have the impacts of the visitor industry that's really impacting our traffic. You know, but there's low-hanging fruit that we can attain. We, we're gonna take a look at four-way interceptions, where it's appropriate, and deploy roundabouts, which will keep traffic moving. We're gonna take a look at ways that we can uh, work with the state of, of Hawaii to implement the Kapa'a transportation plan, which includes adding another lane on the north end of the bypass road and also the highway widening fronting cocoa palms. You know, these are all priority projects that are on the list right now, which is known as the STIP. These are all projects that the state has prioritized in doing. I can tell you that the U.S. Federal Highways has conducted a study of all of the road projects on Kauai. It cost $3.2 billion. They also forecasted how much revenue we're gonna see from all means of financing, federal, state, and county over the next 20 years. We're gonna get $600 million. That's a $2.6 billion gap. You know, we've heard about building new roads. I can tell you the price tag on that road and utilizing that Kane Hall Road comes with a price tag of $500 million. It's very popular and it's an easy thing to say that we're gonna build another road, but our fiscal reality doesn't allow us to do it. State and federal government has all said that their top priority is maintenance of current inventory. But there's some small loan hanging fruit that we can go and attain, and that's what our focus is going to be on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Oposo, you have 30 seconds to respond. The cost to use our existing network of Cane Hall roads is not $500 million. The, the cost for a new highway that the state is talking about is a very is, a, is an amount that we will never see. The existing Cane Hall roads that currently sits that we use during emergencies in Kapa'a, that road actually expands or extends out towards Kaloa. I'm talking about those roads. The bottom line is this, we can't wait for the state. We can't wait for the federal government. We need to get cars off of the roads today onto those network of Cane roads and we need to do it soon. Thank you. And, and that's the type of rhetoric that has gotten into this problem by continuing to chase things that we are not going to be able to attain. We need our federal partners, we need our state partners to say that we don't need them and we're going to pay for it on our own. The only way to do that feasibly is to double your property taxes. I don't know where the money is going to come from. Thank you.
Mr. Raposo, this is your question. How would you describe your leadership style and what leadership strengths would you bring to the mayor's office? You have two minutes, sir. I think my leadership style obviously is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm accountable to the people and I will hold my appointed uh, employees accountable to me that in fact, you know, I again, my time in the military, my training in the military, uh, as well as the police department, uh, you know, it's number one is training and number one is get, making sure that people have the resources that they need to do the job. And at that point, number one, hiring qualified, competent people in the departments that they're at. You see, I haven't committed any positions to anyone. Uh, people tell me, well, you better start looking. Well, you know what? The bottom line is at the end of the day, come November 7th, if I'm successful as the mayor, uh, that week will be, I'll be busy with interviews and trying to find people uh, to fill that cabinet. And this may sound really weird to all of you, but some of the people in my cabinet may be wearing a Kawakami shirt today. Maybe wearing a Raposo, Lenny Raposo shirt or a Joanne Yukimura shirt. At the end of the day, my, my cabinet will be made up of competent, qualified, the best we can find on this island. And in some cases, we may have to go outside. But I will tell you this, my administration will be complete with qualified, competent, accountable people that can do the job and, and will be able to convert this county from a, a county that right now is, I would say is kind of, uh, kind of broken and get everybody back on the same page and restore pride to this county and get our employees to be happy to come to work again and get the jobs done. But at the end of the day, it's competence and qualified people that, that I will appoint. It's not gonna be political. And you can ask anybody in my camp, they'll tell you straight up, that's the first message in my, my meetings, is if you're here to get a job, you need to leave. I'm looking for the best. I want to succeed as a mayor. I don't want to fail. Thank you. That's a call from you. Uh, 30 seconds to respond. 30 seconds, my leadership style is honest, collaborative, innovative, energetic, and very positive, very optimistic. I'm a bridge builder. I have the ability and have done in the past to bring the public sector and the private sector together to solve some of our problems. You know, you need that type of positive energy. Inspirational is another word that would describe me. I'm going to bring out the very best in each and every individual and to make sure that they know that it's not just a job, that every single day our mission is to improve the quality of life for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This will challenge each and everyone out there listening. If you have a question about my leadership style, call the county clerk's office tomorrow, ask to speak to any employee and ask them what the positive changes has occurred in the county, uh, Office of County Clerks and the Council Services since I became the chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Clark County, this is your question. Many argue that raising the minimum wage would increase economic activity and spur job growth. Yet others believe raising the minimum wage would force businesses to lay off employees and raise unemployment levels and ultimately increase poverty. What is your perspective on the impact of a $15 an hour minimum wage? You have two minutes. The unintended consequences would be disastrous for some, for some smaller mom and pops. I can tell you, you know, at Big Save, we, we were never able to hire and compete with the visitor industry. I can tell you when we, when we talked to our workers and we polled our workers and we had tremendous amounts of loyal workers, I can tell you most of you folks can agree that when you went into a big save, you saw the same worker year after year and you know what? That wage is just the tip of the iceberg. What's important to people is that they feel that they have a job and that they're cared for, that they're respected, that they feel that they're part of a team. For us, many of our workers stayed because we were willing to work with them with their lifestyle. We're a family business. If they had kids that had soccer on Saturdays, we expected those parents to be able to go watch their kids and their soccer games. We encouraged our workers to go out there and coach. We provided great benefits. We provided great vacation leave. We took care of our workers. And I can tell you, the wage is the tip of the iceberg. And it sounds, it would sound uncompassionate on myself to not advocate for a $15 minimum wage, but I can tell you the unintended consequences that comes with that is something that most people cannot understand unless you understand the true cost of doing business. It is very hard 
for a business to be able to turn their lights on every single day, keep their workers employed, when we have the highest cost of business in the nation. We need to really work with our businesses to give them the tools that they need to retain the workers. And I can tell you, the $15 minimum wage is something that sounds great in concept, and I hope and we strive to attain that. Every single day, it's a goal that we set. But I can tell you, for Kauai, the, the unintended consequences could be disastrous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with 100%. You know, if you set the, the bar or the base at 15, every other pay scale moves up as well. You, you cannot just uh, increase the $15 minimum wage and, and expect all the other salary scales, especially in the visitor industry, to remain the same. So the effect is going to be uh, compounding. Uh, you, you see it. You go to rental car agencies, you see kiosks instead of humans. You go to McDonald's, you see kiosks instead of humans. Um, I think the, the again, as Derek called it, the unintended consequences is something that I don't think people understand. Thank you very much. It's tough for this short 15 second. <laughs> well, Derek, you have 15 seconds. Well, yeah, I'd like, like to add on that, you know, the thing that we do is attract industries that can pay a living wage. And that's why I couldn't believe that you don't think that STEM has a future in Kauai. These STEM jobs transition into agricultural jobs, creative media, the film industry. There is a STEM um, job opportunity on Kauai. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo, in order to prevent government gridlock at the county level, how would you maintain positive working relationship, relationships with your colleagues, especially the members of the Kauai County Council? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. I think it's, it just comes down to communication. I think one of the things that uh, we, we don't have with the current administration, I think, is the communications that we used to have uh, when, you know, Mayor Baptiste, I mean, Bernard and I are very good friends, and on a personal level, we, we often communicate, but uh, as a formal structure of, of communication between the administration and the council, I don't, we're, we're lacking that. And uh, as I've always said, you know, the council, and I, I think I speak for our council members, is that I, we don't like surprises. We don't like to read about something that's happening in, on Facebook or Twitter or in the paper. Um, or when something comes across and we put on the agenda, that's the first time we've, we've seen or heard it. Uh, obviously, expanding the communication, setting up in the initial stage of the, of the new term, a goal, a, a true goal uh, setting workshop, uh, a, like, a, like a session where we go up to Koke and hammer it out. No cell phones, they don't work up in Koke, so that's where it needs to be. And just individually and collectively figure out what are the priorities that we can honestly achieve without, uh, without argument. And let's focus on those items. We all know that traffic's an issue, housing's an issue. Let's use this time to formulate a game plan that we agree on and, and, and pursue down that track. And the things that we don't agree as much, we, we, we save for a later time. But it's the communication. Uh, the mayor with the department heads, the department heads with the different individual council chair or committee chairs of the council, keeping everybody in the loop, I think, uh, with, with frequent and consistent meetings is, is the way to go. And that's something that I would advocate and I would uh, aggressively pursue. Thank you. Mr. Charles County, your 30 seconds to respond, sir. You know, as mayor, the county council is really going to feel like they're a part of the mayor's team as well. And I'm hoping that I will be a member of that county council team as well. We're going to be very collaborative. We're going to sit down. We're going to address issues. That's the thing. We're going to have to stay focused that our number one job is to improve the quality of life to see where we can find collaboration, where we can find agreement and common thread. This is gonna require that type of inspirational bridge building type of collaboration that you often don't see in government. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a proposal, last 15 seconds? Yeah, you know, I was never a very good athlete, but I, I, uh, I consider myself a very good coach. And, you know, uh, motivating people to do their work is, is kind of what I do. I enjoy doing it. And that is really what I plan to do in the, uh, as a mayor uh, with, the, with the city council at the time. Thank you. Mr. Talcom, your question is as follows. In December 2017, all four of Hawaii's mayors committed to achieving 100% renewable transportation by 2045 and 100% renewable fleets within the respective counties by 2035. 
Do you support these goals? And if so, what will you do as mayor to move towards them? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you, absolutely. I do support these goals. I can tell you currently right now, our transportation agency has done a great job as far as chasing grants for a more energy efficient fleet. We have the opportunity to receive 100% electricity driven buses, and that's gonna be a start. You know, the other thing that we're gonna do is that at our own county facilities, we're gonna start deploying, deploying some of these electric charging stations for our vehicles. That's the one thing that has hesitancy for people to move over into electric vehicles. It's the, 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 the fear and the threat that they may run out of batteries halfway across this island as they commute. So we're gonna do our part. We're gonna lead by example. We're gonna take a look at some of our facilities where we can deploy these energy efficient and electric charging stations. We're gonna be putting up photovoltaic on some of our facilities to be more energy efficient. And we're gonna support our transportation agency as innovators and as pilots as we move forward into the future. We have a tremendous opportunity on Kauai. Each and every one of us are members of our co-op. That's gonna be the biggest piece that we're gonna to have to work with. Sitting down with KIEC to see where we can find common ground because we all have the same common goal. To be more sustainable, to be environmentally friendly, to move away from fossil fuels. And we're gonna to have to do this because our future depends on it. Our job is to ensure that we leave something better than what we found it in. So absolutely, we're gonna support every single endeavor that we can to move away from fossil fuels, whether it's with our motor vehicle fleet or the way that we operate as county government. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. so, Poldy, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, to, to sit up here and say we don't support, I think would be, uh, be crazy. But at the same time, we, you know, we gotta be realist as well. You know, some of the, the vehicles that we use uh, in our county day-to-day -day operations may not be conducive to electric vehicles, so I don't know if we can do 100%, but at the end of the day, whenever we can, we should. Now with the new uh, batteries that are developed, the, the range of these electric vehicles are much more usable for county workers, so uh, I do see a transition to, uh, to electric vehicles throughout the next few years. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. it called for me, your last 15 seconds, sir? I think the, the next equation is also working with our, our, our motor vehicle dealerships to see where we can find some nexus to partner up. You know, we're gonna have to find a way to work with every segment of this community to make sure that we're more environmentally sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo, this is your question. According to a recent study, the homeless population on Kauai is decreasing. Nevertheless, homelessness persists throughout the county. What is your plan to end the homeless crisis on Kauai? Thank you. First of all, I don't think anyone will be in shock when I tell them that the homeless has not decreased on Kauai. I'm not sure the way they did that report. I'm not sure how they count, but we have a problem of the hidden homeless here. And if you don't believe that, go to Waimea River Mount, go to Hanamalo Beach Park. You gotta go in the bushes. You need to talk to the homeless people. You don't just go to the park and count one, two, three, four, okay, five, no. We have a serious problem of homelessness here. And yes, they may not be visible, like on Oahu, yet. But if we don't get a handle on this, uh, we are gonna become like Honolulu very, very soon. Number one, we gotta start looking at a shelter, a very, uh, a shelter that we can house these people that, that's not a transitional shelter, not an emergency shelter when you kick them out in the morning. It's a shelter where we can legitimately put these people in uh, to be safe and uh, to be sheltered. I'm, I'm really concerned about our kupuna, our elderly and our kids that are out there homeless today and tonight. And we're all sitting in here, going home to a nice warm house tonight. These kids are in the bushes, in the rain. We need to take care of them. I have been a strong advocate and trying to push this administration to create safe zones so we can create shelters. And I'm talking temporary shelters. I'm talking GP media military tents that these, these these moms and grandmas can sleep in at night with an area <clears throat> in an area that's safe, that they don't have to worry, sleep with one eye open. I've talked about opening up the, the Vidina Stadium parking lot for the homeless that have vehicles, that we could open up the facility at night so they could shower, shave, use the restrooms, and clean it up in the morning. We, there's a lot of things we can do, and the mayor can do immediately, and I plan to do that. We need to take care of our homeless people 
30% is legitimate homeless, 30% suffer from mental illness, 30% are problem children. And we handle all of them accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you. I sit on the advisory board for Catholic Charities and their main mission is to address homelessness. I can tell you there are homeless people that want help that we can help and then there's another segment that doesn't want the help. We're going to focus our energy on helping those that want to get help. We're going to be working with realtors, we're going to be working with landowners and really deploying that Housing First program that has been proven to show that it can work. We're gonna work with the Vet Center to identify veterans that are out there that have fought so hard for our country that are out there when we're so bad. It's an injustice that needs to be addressed and we need to do it in a feasible way. Thank you so much. Mr. Porter, last 15 seconds, sir. We need tangible solutions. We've worked with realtors, we've spoken to realtors, we've spoken to all of these agencies. The reality is we need to put up structures, physical structures and get them in there and help them with the social services that they need today. Thank you. Mr. Paul Kami, your question. Hawaii is consistently considered one of the most difficult states to do business, and the difficulty with the county permitting process alone would have earned us the title. What steps can you take as mayor to reduce the burden of opening, owning, and operating a business here on Kauai? In two minutes, sir. Thank you. And, um We've seen it. We've seen it as a family how difficult it can be to get permitting to even do a renovation to an existing structure. You know, we're going to have to take a look at our permitting process to create more efficiencies. And I can tell you, there are members of the private sector that have been wanting to come to the table, wanting to share their ideas of how we can be more efficient, how we can be more creative, how we can be more conducive as a county, and, and really get back to that customer service oriented type of government that we should be. I think we need to make our workers realize that their jobs are not just jobs. Like I said, all of our, all of our employees are dependent on property taxes to pay for those raises. And every time that we delay a building permit, we're not just delaying a project, we're delaying revenue coming into the county to pay for those services. Every time that we delay a project because of permitting, Somebody is sitting on the bench that could be at work. And every day that a project is delayed because of permitting, those construction costs keep on going up and up. So it, it takes that type of leadership to, to be able to come in, explain the process, explain how important that you are, that everybody, the unseen worker, the secretarial, the administration, how key they are, and recognize their value and inspire them to do more. We're going to have to take a look at where we can get permitting and work with the state to be more efficient. The days of just having a project delayed because a permit was sitting on the desk is going to be unacceptable because we've had to live through it. We've had to, to see how much it costs as far as project delays. And on the other side, these businesses need to be educated on what they can do to make sure that they have the necessary paperwork as well. We're going to work hand in hand with these businesses to make sure that they have everything in line as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oposo, you have 30 seconds, sir. You know, when I started my business many years ago, I went to the Small Business Development Center at KCC, and the gentleman walked me through the process. That's what we have to train our planning department, our buildings division. We got to remind ourselves we're community servants, that we serve the public. Our job is not to be so critical. And, and, and create an obstruction. Our job is to help you through the process and get you that permit as soon as we can because we have businesses on Oahu. I know I have friends on Oahu that are developers, that are business owners that will refuse to come here because of the length of time to get a permit. Thank you. Now we had to skip a duplicate question, so we're going to for this question for Mr. Raposo. What will you do to protect, perpetuate, and preserve Hawaiian culture on Kauai and Niihau? Thank you very much. Again, you know, working with the community organizations, we have developed, Mayor uh, Cavallo has uh, developed many stewardship agreements with cultural sites such as Kaneoluma and Pinpoipu and, and, and other historical cultural practices and sites here. Uh, we need to work with the, the Hawaiian community the cultural community, cultural practitioners, and, and work in partnership. 
it is so very important that we protect and preserve our native culture. I'm Portuguese, I'm not Hawaiian, but I, I don't know my Portuguese culture. I've only been on Kauai all my life. So am I aware of all of the Hawaiian culture uh, practices? No, I'm not. And is our youth? No, we're not. Working with, you know, I'll bring up Coco Palms because I think you read in a paper that um, there's a few of us, Derek, myself, as well as the mayor, are, are looking at what can we do with that parcel should that project not be able to move forward. But that would be an example of turning that into a cultural park, utilizing those organizations to come in and help and teach and train and allow our kids to go in, our visitors to go in and learn this culture and, and protect and preserve it because once this culture disappears, it is gone forever. And I am actually worried about that because we have commercialized, a lot of the cultural practices here have been commercialized. Our luau's are no longer authentic, it's more tourist, and I'm not just talking about here on Kauai, but throughout the state. And we need to grab, grab a hold of our, our, our true culture and, and, and practice it. And I, and I believe in an area like that in Coco Palms, uh, where we could convert that over to a, a, a beautiful culture, Hawaiian cultural center or cultural park is, is one of the directions that, that I'd like to take. Thank you. We're going to continue to build upon Mayor Cavallo's wonderful work to preserve our culture. You know, as a native Hawaiian, I'm very proud to see that our island is starting to identify our mokus and our ahupua'as. You know, it's one to educate our kids and our local residents, but it also educates the visitor industry as well. Those visitors need to know how important our culture is and to protect their bahipana, to know what is kapu, what's not allowable. And we need to protect places that are meant for local people. We have lost so many special places to guidebooks and to the like. We need to move forward to protect that very special places. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fulton, do you have to This question is for you, Mr. Kalapani. How would you create more opportunities for our youth to stay in Hawaii rather than seek opportunity on the mainland or elsewhere to answer. You know, that's the, the, the question of where do we diversify our economy. And I think I, I mentioned it before. You know, when we're talking about 21st century jobs, when we're talking about technology, when we're talking about STEM, which is so important and near and dear to my heart, we also factor in that technology is a double-edged sword. As companies start to utilize automation and robotics, it's actually removing the, necessi the necessity of having a human being to do those jobs. So we've taken a look to identify what are two segments that are always going to need that human element. And it's always going to be early childhood education, education at the middle school and elementary level and the high school level. You're gonna, you're gonna need to require that human element for geriatric care. I can tell you as we age, and as we face the realities of the silver tsunami, these are all industries and sectors that if we grow, they can pay a living wage. The Regency at Puakea right now is, is over capacity, meaning that they have people on the waiting list that can afford to get in that don't have a place because we don't have enough beds. I can tell you, if we work closely with the state to go and identify that Mahilona property so that we can get an assisted living facility for every income level for a kupuna. Those are jobs that will be created for our kids to be able to stay at home. And they're good paying jobs. When we take a look at our film industry, our creative media industry as well, these are all industries that our schools are already grooming our students for. Kevin Matsunaga at Chiefest Kamakahele Middle School is an award-winning teacher who brings team after team to be award-winning nationally. These are all sectors that we can invest in to ensure that our kids can go off and get an education and come back home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Raposi, you're 30 seconds. Sir. Thank you. And again, this kind of goes back to my earlier response about economic development. This is where our economic development office will, will, will be focused on. What sectors out there are available? And what sectors and how do we partner with our schools and, and, and uh, colleges that can, can keep the kids here. Uh, like I said, agriculture is one of them, but we do have a, a ton of other uh, industries that, that could. The other thing that we I think we overlook all the time is entrepreneurship. How about we teach our kids to go into business for themselves and to provide products or services to our residents here and be able to benefit? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman, you have 15 seconds. 
you know, we're going to have to ensure that we have the IT infrastructure, that 21st infrastructure that's going to be needed for these high-tech jobs. I look forward to working with Spectrum. I look forward to working with Wintel and KIEC to see where we can improve that IT infrastructure as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Okozo, the last question. The Sustainable Hawaii Initiative aims to double local food production in Hawaii by 2020. What can you do at the county to help increase food sustainability on Kauai? You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. Again, promoting you know, homegrown food. Uh, we have ranchers on Kauai. We have animals that are being raised, that are being sent off to be beefed up, sent back home. Keeping these, uh, these businesses here on Kauai, whether it's, it's uh, fruits, vegetables, flowers, Horses, ranch, uh, cows, or pigs. We we need to provide us the, the, the infrastructure for them. Slaughterhouses, disinfection uh, stations at the airport for our flowers to be sent out. We can do a better job. Again, I mean, you know, I, I, tonight I don't think anybody want to be my economic development director, but um, that person's going to be busy, and we're going to make sure that office is funded to the point that it needs to, so we can explore these opportunities. The bottom line is this: we want to promote local farming, we want to promote local foods, we want to promote this local operations. But if they cannot afford to do it, if they don't have a market or an opportunity to export, export their, their goods and to create a, uh, a business that they can survive here, how are they going to stay in business to feed ourselves? So we got to work with them. Economic development to me I think is much bigger than, than uh, uh, processing a few grants, it is a huge undertaking that I expect to take full advantage of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kalkan, you have 30 seconds, sir. Our ag expert in the OED is going to work hand in hand with our farmers to continue the programs that, that we've been able to create. We're going to be supporting the Kilauea Ag Park. We're going to spend some resources to educate farmers on how to be business people. Farming is business. We need to give them the tools that they can actually go out there and make a profit. We're going to support them by ensuring that they have the water that they need. We're going to partner them up with state agencies that can really help them get on their way to fruition and to success. And it's going to be a top priority. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Again, you know, we have the models at work, Kilauea Ag Park. It took a long time to get that there, uh, and we do need to, to help them a little more, but using those as models and taking that throughout the island and, ch and exchanging the product from, from vegetables and fruits to flowers, uh, that's, that's really the way to go. No need to recreate the wheel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the question and answer portion of the forum for our mayoral candidates. Each candidate now has two minutes for closing remarks, starting with Mr. Carl Kami. Again, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and I want to thank all of you. Uh, Mel, you know what? Thank you. I mean, this, this has been exciting and, and I know it's awkward at times because we have to work together, but you know, at the end of the day, we're brothers and we all have the common goal. We have a passion for Kauai. We have children that we want to make sure that they can live, work, and play here on Kauai. We have a different style, but I think that we really complement each other and I think that over the course of the years, I've just gained a tremendous respect for your style and for your ideals as well. And when I say that you make me a better person, you do. You are the very best candidate that I could be running against right now. You have allowed me to grow, you have sharpened me, and like I said, iron sharpens iron. You know, I've been your newspaper delivery boy, I've worked in the grocery stores, and I've worked my way up. I've been able to, to have a one-man operation with my shave ice stand down in LALA during my summers as a college student. And maybe I saw you in the stores, I can tell you, that I am so energized and appreciative of the opportunity to have been able to serve you in the private sector and now in the public sector as well. Whether it was with KIUC, the County Council, or at the Hawaii State House of Representatives, each and every moment has just been a tremendous blessing. I look forward to bringing honest, integrity, collaboration, and bridge building into that mayor's office. And at the end of the day, when the dust settles, all of us are going to have to come together because all of us is going to be required to be at that table to move Kauai in the direction that it needs to be. For our keiki, for our kupuna, we need to lead by example. We need to set the tone for the Chamber of Commerce and for all of those private sector businesses 
that have been knocking on the door to come in, the door is open. E komomai. Mahalo. Thank you. Mr. Raposo, you have two minutes. Those are mine. Thank you very much, and thank you as well for being here tonight. Thank you, Chamber and Derek. Thank you very much as well. I still regret asking you to run for council, but uh, uh, likewise, I, I honestly could not think of, of uh, someone better to run against. Uh, we've, we've, you know, we've been through a lot uh, over the years, and I appreciate appreciate you, Derek. I really do. Uh, it's going to be a great campaign, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the people will win. Uh, you got two great candidates. You got a choice this time. You have a choice, and, and Kauai will be better regardless of the outcome on November 6th. I mean, I hope I'm the mayor, but at the end of the day, I'm a voter, I'm a resident, and, and I think we'll, this island will be blessed either which way. You know, what I bring, you know, I, I born and raised here, you know, I, I started working at 14 uh, because I had to, uh, and, I, and I've worked every single day of my life ever since. You know, I know what it's like to struggle. I can tell you that I don't look at, at revenue enhancements. I mean, they call revenue enhancements oftentimes, and it's really tax increases. I have a problem with that because I know what it's like. I know what it's like when you don't have a dollar in your wallet. I know what it's like when my mom uh, never had money and we had to thank God she had family that, that could help her, but I know there's a lot of people that don't. I know that there's a lot of people that don't have that extra $20. We need to cut this spending of this county before we even think of raising taxes. That is my plan. Accountability, aggressive, passion. I know it's hard. I know a lot of people say, no, you're not approachable. I gotta tell you, I love this island a lot. And I will fight for this island as best I can to the day I die. I wanna serve you as your mayor. I, I, I've, I've served on the council for 14 years, like I said. I wanna continue serving this island. I, I'm, I'm a victim of term limits, but I got so much more gas in the tank. I wanna be your mayor, I ask for your support. And, and you know, my goal is to keep Kauai moving. My goal is to keep Kauai moving in the right direction. If I win, Kauai wins. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a little big hand for our two candidates right here. Also, ladies and gentlemen, have a little big hand for our volunteer timekeepers, Tyler Rodiguero and Nancy Kana, right in the front here. We would like to say thank you again to our sponsors for this evening's event. Family and Friends of Agriculture, Outrigger at Tijuana, HLTA Koi Chapter, Pack Bill, Hawaii Board of Realtors, Com Radio, Hawaii Filipino Chamber of Commerce, KKCR Community Radio, YWCA of Hawaii, Hawaii K Community Television. Please remember to vote. Election Day is November 6th. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'm Charlie Yona, your moderator for this evening. Have a great evening. Aloha and a ho!